truth is so obscure in these times and falsehood so established that unless we love the truth, we cannot know it. That's a quote that seems very relevant to today and to our culture. But not much has changed since the mid-1600s when theologian Pascal penned those words. The mid-1600s. That's what the world looked like. And in the name of progress, not much has changed on that front as far as the world and its distorted view of truth. Look back even further and we see Paul's concern for people and their acceptance of the truth. In 2 Thessalonians 2.10, God's own word says that they perish because they did not accept the love of the truth in order to to be saved. All the way back to when Paul penned those words, God's own word, to us, the church, the world did not have a correct grasp on truth. And here we see that John was so concerned, and more importantly, like Paul, led by the Holy Spirit, to write scripture, that is this letter, on the subject. John's major point through this letter is this. We must love the truth of Christ's teaching and so walk in His commands. We must love the truth of Christ's teaching and so walk in His commands. Today we see that we must both love and live the truth. It's what God's own word directs us to, as you heard it proclaimed a few moments ago. We must both love and live the truth. It is necessary, and it is good. And although John does not explicitly define truth, as he does love later in today's passage, What he has in mind is this. The truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ as God's self-revelation in the incarnation. That's the truth that John is getting at. That is this. That God so loved the world, He sent His own Son. And what did Jesus do here? Lived perfectly, in the flesh, tempted, but maintained perfection for us, and went on to die the death that we deserve for the darkness of all of our sin. And again, on that cross He hung, and it was finished. God poured out the wrath that was owed to us on Christ and crushed Him. But Jesus did not stay dead. He conquered death for His own glory, glory of the Father and for our good. He conquered it and He rose again to life. And if you would trust and believe in Him, you'll have new life also. That's the truth. God, not some abstract being. God, in Jesus Christ represented, in that incarnation revealed to the world, Jesus and His gospel, the truth, and God's love for us. That's what John's getting at today when he talks about the truth. It's important that we have that correct. It's paramount today, 
just like it has always been, that we know the truth, that we love the truth, that we accept the truth, that we are changed by the truth, and that we walk in the truth. All that's revealed here in our passage today from God's own word. This is contrary to a world that says there is no absolute truth. It's contrary to our flesh that wants truth to be relative to my situation. This is my truth because of these circumstances. You don't get my truth because you have a different perspective. That is false. Truth is absolute. And it is the gospel of Jesus. It is the person of Jesus. And it is the fact that God loves us and it's proven. God's Word clarifies this. In John's Gospel account, same author of this letter, in his Gospel account, in chapter 14 and verse 6, Jesus says, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Jesus speaking through God's Word. He is the truth. He says it. He is our authority. He defines truth, and He says that it is He. Jesus, absolute truth. To illustrate this uh, chasm between Christianity and modern thought or culture, I want you to think about it like this. You've got modern thought, our culture, and you've got Christianity. Each of them are on tracks, trains on a track, seeking to reach a mountaintop. And both of them can claim that they are riding on the rails of truth and love. Each of them can claim that. And they're able to, to say that, to express that. But only one of them is telling you the truth. They're trying to reach the top of a mountain. Culture. Culture rides on the rails of relativism for truth and sentimentality for love. Those are the rails that the train of culture are riding on and trusting in. Relativism for truth. That truth is relative to your situation. You define your truth based on your perspective. That's one rail. And the other, sentimentality for love. Sentimentalism. That would be a love based on feeling. If it feels like love, it is love. If you have these feelings for others, then you love them. If they feel the same way for you, then they love you. Those are the two rails that culture depends upon to make it to the top of this mountain. Those are the rails that culture depends upon, and there is no traction. And instead of steady progress to a perfect world that they're striving for, whether it be nirvana, enlightenment, making the world a better place before there's no existence anymore, or a distorted view of heaven. They are in fact careening to their ultimate and eternal destruction in hell. That's the truth and the love that the world would have you to place your trust in. And it's false. And in the name of so much progress, there is only regression and ultimate destruction in hell. Or, by the grace of God, you have Christianity. Christianity who rides on the rails of truth and love in the ultimate and correct sense. Truth, and that is Christ and His work for love. Christ is the truth because He says so, 
And God's love for us is clearly displayed in His work and is made perfect. And up the mountain we could not climb, God draws us, not of our own power, but of His. Christ, come down off the mountain to lay the tracks of His work for us and His personhood for us so that the train of Christianity could make it to our ultimate goal, and that is life forever, glorifying, worshiping our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Those are the two options we have for truth. One is real, and the other is a lie. So, what do we do while we're on this train? That's what John lays out in our passage today. What do we do while we're here? Well, God is drawing us to our ultimate salvation in the end. What do we do? There are two sections in today's passage. We've got verses 1 through 3, love the truth. And verses 4 through 6, live the truth. Verses 1 through 3, that would be embracing and enjoying the truth, who is Jesus. The gospel of Jesus, the good news of Jesus, who He is, what He's done. In verses 4 through 6, having concern for what you believe and how you believe it. Those are our two sections today. John mentions truth five times in verses 1 through 4. Love four times in verses 4 through 6. Walk, that is your lifestyle, three times in verses 4 through 6. And command four times in verses 4 through 6. In this time period, it was common, a common method to repeat words for emphasis. I do believe that John is clearly seeking to emphasize these words for our good and ultimately God's glory. So let's focus on God's Word together. The first section, love the truth, verses 1 through 3. We see in verse 1, the elder to the elect lady and her children, whom I love in truth, not only I, but also all who know the truth. Wait, who is John writing to? This, you may be thinking, is different. Who is this lady with children and what was she chosen for? I don't see this as the norm, the recipient of a letter from an apostle. And this is another reason that it's important not to lone wolf Christianity. It's important that we gather together with the saints to be taught God's Word. Not to trust our own understanding, but that which has been proven. Because this could easily lead you to think a lot of distorted things about God's Word and why this was written to a woman and, and in, a, in an age of the Da Vinci Code to try and find other things going on in the background here. But John has in fact written this letter to the church, chosen by God to be His children, His people. And so when you see the elder to the elect lady and her children, that would be the elder John, who is most likely the oldest surviving apostle at this point, the elder of the church, to the elect lady, the church, and her children, those who are a part of it. It could seem strange until you look a little deeper. The Greek word for church is in the feminine form. That word is ecclesia. That should probably sound kind of familiar. If you've ever wondered why in the world we would name our church something so difficult to say, uh, it is because it is the, the Greek word for church. And it is in the feminine. 
And it makes more sense if you look deeper, like in Ephesians chapter 5, verses 22 through 27, we see that the church and Christ are compared to a bride and a bridegroom. Having the understanding that God created marriage to reflect the love He has for the church helps this to make more sense. Let's look at that together. Again, that is Ephesians chapter 5, verses 22 through 27. God's Word says, Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and is himself its Savior. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. Verse 25, Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. And so when John here refers to the church as the elect lady, it makes sense. Under that understanding, a true understanding of the word, it makes sense that it would be a, a feminine word that he would use for the church and for her children. And later in this letter, we see in verse 13, John writes, this is from the children of your elect sister. The children of your elect sister greet you. So further proof that he's writing from one church to another church. And so with that clarified, we see here that John truly loves the church because of the same thing that reveals God's love for the church. It's the gospel of Jesus. And not just John, but all who know the truth, all who know, really know, who love and cherish Jesus and have been changed by Him. We see written here that they love the church. I'll read it again. Whom I love in truth, and not only I, but also all who know the truth. If all who know the truth love the church, if all who know Jesus and trust Him and have been changed by Him love the church, where does that leave you? John uses us and we seven times in three sentences here. It's more verses, but if you consider the sentences, it's seven times in three sentences. If you are a Christian and you do not love the church as God defines love, you have one of two options. That is either to go on living contrary to God's Word, or it is to repent and wake up. God's Word here should be waking you up if that is you. If you love and trust Jesus, but you don't love His church, you need to question whether or not you really even love Jesus. It's in God's Word that if you know the truth, you love the church. You are either trying to go to sleep when you need to wake up, or you are dead in your trespasses and sins. There's no choice there. There's no other option. Examine yourself. 
It's warranted by God's Word. Examine yourself. And there's only one thing you can do. If you are dead in your trespasses and sins and Jesus is trying to wake you up today, then wake up and embrace Him. For He loves you so much. And if you are trying to go to sleep and God's Word is trying to rouse you, then wake up and embrace Him because you know He loves you so much. Your brothers and sisters need you. It's a battle waging against darkness. When you bear the light, you're really going to go into the barracks and go to sleep? This Christian life is communal. That communal catalyst is the church. Is what brings us together is your fellow brothers and sisters coming together. Don't deny that. Because if you do, I fear that it reveals that you are not saved. And if you aren't, there is true, absolute, solid, no doubt, hope for you. And that is in Jesus Christ, the truth, and His work for you, God's love on your behalf. Turn to Him, as Kelton said earlier, for the first time or for the thousandth time. Turn to Him. We see in verse 2 that those who know deeply the truth, that is Jesus, love others because the truth is in them. Verse 2 says, because of the truth that abides in us and will be with us forever. Those who love Jesus love others because the truth is in them. That is, the Holy Spirit resides within them and draws them to not choose the flesh, but to choose the way of the Spirit to love the church and so love Jesus by following His commands. And this word, in here, could be translated as among also because of the truth that abides in or among us and will be with us forever. That's Christ. He will be with us forever. Praise Him. And what is born on the back of Christ? We see in verse 3, Grace, mercy, and peace will be with us from God the Father and from Jesus Christ the Father's Son. In truth, and love on those rails Christ and his work for us is given to us grace mercy and peace and it will be perfected one day and it will last forever And it is only granted from God the Father and His Son, Jesus. If you are seeking these things, which surely you are, because you're human, and every one of us knows that we need them, grace and mercy and peace, if you're honest with yourself and your state, on your own outside of Christ, you know your need for grace, mercy, and peace. The only place that you will receive those it's from Jesus Christ and God the Father. John Stock clarifies their roles well. Grace and mercy 
are both expressions of God's love. Grace to the guilty and undeserving. Mercy to the needy and the helpless. Peace is that restoration of harmony with God, others, and self we call salvation. Put together, peace indicates the character of salvation, mercy, our need of it, and grace, God's free provision of it in Christ. Don't be a cynic and deny how good this is. Don't be a cynic and look to your situation and not to Christ. Don't be a cynic and look to the world and not to Christ. If you look to those things for your grace, mercy, and peace, there is none of it. If you look to your situation for grace, mercy, and peace, you'll have none. But if you in all things look to Christ and His good news, from here until eternity, you'll have grace, mercy, and peace because you know your eternal home is secure and you know that Christ is there. God is promising us all we need and want and it comes freely through Christ forever. Every single one of your anxieties could be traced back to your fear of a lack of grace, your fear of a lack of mercy, or your fear of a lack of peace. And that anxiety is sinful. It's something we are called to abstain from. And that should be clear when you see that those things are secure in Jesus. Do you trust Him for them? It quiets all anxiety, if so. Look to Him, not your situation, not the world. Grace provided by Jesus, and that is that God would write our story so that He could look upon us with favor, and that is done through Jesus. God looks on you with favor. Mercy. That God would not give us what we deserve because of the darkness of our sin is done because of Jesus. He poured it out on Him. And as Jesus said it, it's finished. It's done. Mercy from God is secure. Grace from God is secure. And peace with God and one day with everything is done. It's a solid and secure hope. It's done because God said it's done. And He does not return on His promises with empty hands. It's done because of Jesus. Forever. Praise be to Jesus to whom we owe everything. This is why we gather as the church and sing His praises. On truth and love, we are being carried to the promised land. To be with the truth, that is Jesus, loved by Him, and to love Him face to face forever. Praise God. Embrace the truth. Enjoy the truth. Embrace the gospel and enjoy Jesus. And if you do, it will be evident in the fact that you live in the truth. Which brings us to verses 4 through 6. Here John is concerned with his readers' practical lives as Christians. An apostle writing a letter to the church that is God's Word. He is concerned with his readers' practical lives as Christians, that their everyday ethical conduct would be in line with Scripture. It's so important that it's in the Bible.
Their everyday conduct is important to Him. That is their walk, that it would be in step with and keeping God's commandments. As Jonathan Edwards said, he does this surgery. He wields a scalpel a little more poetically than uh, some of his some of his contemporaries. The informing of the understanding is all vain any further than it affects the heart, which is the same thing, has influence on the affections. Does all this learning of the Scripture make you feel proud that you know more, or does it change your heart and your affections? Vance Havner, modern preacher, puts it a little bit more simply, cuts a straight line for the surgery. What we live is what we really believe. Everything else is just so much religious talk. And if you're from around here, it's like Grandpa says. Takes the scalpel and sticks it straight in your heart. It's like Grandpa says, you can talk the talk, but do you walk the walk? You can talk it all day long, but do you walk it? John uses similar wording, which we'll see in a moment. But all knowledge of the truth is worthless if you do not live according to it. It is worthless. It means nothing. Because if you truly believe it, Jesus truly changes you. And you can't sit in it for long. It does not mean that we don't make mistakes. It does not mean that we don't sin and repent and sin and repent. It doesn't mean that we aren't sanctified, but that we're made exactly perfect the moment that we realize that Jesus is king and accept him. It's not what it means. But you should not be able to spend days and days and weeks and months and years in sin. You should not sit and rest comfortably in it. And if you are, it's not too late to repent of that sin, to turn to Jesus again. It's okay. Turn to Him. It's good to turn to Him. Do so, and don't waste any more time. Let's look at verse 4. I, that is John, rejoiced greatly to find some of your children walking in the truth, just as we were commanded by the Father. Rejoicing greatly, praise to God that some of those who were a part of the church, he saw somewhere, we don't know how many, but he saw some from this church that he's writing to living in accordance and walking in the truth. And he praises God. Let us praise God today for those in the church walking in the truth. It brought John to praise, so much so that he'd mention it here. And what does he say at the end of this verse? Just as we were commanded by the Father. We don't have an option here to choose contrary to God's commands. They had submitted to the true spiritual authority, God, through Christ. We should rejoice along with John because we know how tempting it is to the flesh to submit to other authorities. And there are usually three outside of God. That would be reason. Do you submit to what you think? Do you submit to God at His Word? Another would be tradition, what we've always done. Does that make it right because you've always done it? Does that make it truth? 
Does that make it the way that you should live out your life because it's what you've always done, or your family's always done, or your culture's always done? The other would be experience. That's what we feel. Is that how you determine the way that you walk based on how you feel? If so, repent and turn to what is for the Christian your only option for authority. And that is through the revelation that we submit to God. Revelation of God Himself in Christ, Jesus, the Son, and His Word. If you're like me, then you read the Word, and sometimes you think, that's not going to work. Pragmatism. That's not going to get the results that, that I'm wanting. You may want those results for good reason. I want more people to come and be a part of the church and to come to know and love and cherish and trust Jesus. But if God's Word doesn't prescribe it, or if we go about seeking those good goals by tradition solely, or by experience in what we feel solely, or by reason, what makes the most sense solely, then we're not submitting to God at His authority as we should. Because this is already settled. We don't debate Jesus. We don't debate God's Word. We pro proclaim both. Let's look at verse 5 together. And now I ask you, dear lady, it's asking the church, not as though I were writing you a new commandment, it's very careful to say that, but the one we have had from the beginning, that we love one another. John is going to get into refuting false teachers in next Sunday's passage, but he's leading into it here. He is very careful to say that this is not a new commandment. Someone did not receive a new word from God. Somebody did not pen in their journal God's next revelation speaking to the world. It's God's word that John refers to here. the original word, the old word, the truth. John is pointing to Jesus. We see in his gospel account, chapter 13, verses 34 through 35, and this is Jesus who says this, A new commandment I give you, because he can do that, that you love one another, just as I have loved you, you also are to love one another. By this all people will know you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. Here we see John saying the same thing. Not a new word, not anything contrary to Scripture, but Scripture. And now I ask you, dear lady, not as though I were writing you a new commandment, but the one we have had from the beginning, that is, when they became Christians, that we love one another. You should devote yourself to God by loving His church. Not as some abstract thing, but we know that the church, the church are God's people. And I know when I look out today that many of you do, and I with, with John rejoice 
that God has seen fit to give me family here that love me and love one another that I can love and I know that's going to be returned. Praise God. Praise God. That we love one another. But if you know that that cannot be said of you. Please turn from that. Turn from seeking yourself more than seeking to love your brothers and sisters in Christ. There's so many ways to do it. And this is uh, not a plug as the community pastor, community group pastor. But seriously, we have community groups that are just people who eat dinner together and they talk about God's Word. And they seek to love each other and, and help each other so that you don't have to be alone. Devote yourself to God by devoting yourself to those people. By reminding them of the Gospel. By being there for them physically and spiritually emotionally drain yourself for them because you know they do the same for you and so what is this love it's important that we get this right correct Jesus said that he is the truth and so we know what truth is it's explicit and now we see from God's own word Thank you, God, for using John to give us this. We see from his own word what love is. Verse 6. And this is love. That we walk according to his commandments. This is the commandment, just as you have heard from the beginning so that you should walk in it. Walk according to His commandments with your brothers and sisters in Christ. Not to earn your salvation, but praise God because of it. It's not something we do alone. It's something we do together. John is explicit here. This is how we demonstrate our love for God by loving one another, by walking according to God's commands. All because He first loved us all made perfect in Jesus Christ our Lord. May we praise Him forever. Pray with me. Father, thank You for Jesus. Thank You for Your Holy Spirit residing in us. And pray that You would wake up sleepy Christians. Father, I pray that You would wake the dead so they could realize that they're in the train on your tracks of truth and love. Jesus and his work, you are carrying them home. Help us to walk in your commands and so love one another until we get there. Praise you, Father. In Jesus' name. Amen.